let's move ahead to our next presentation, which will be given by Julia Harrison. And now we have a look on a little bit different forest culture, namely carved wooden confectionery molds. So please, Julia. Hi there, my name is Julia Harrison. I am an artist specializing in wood carving and also an anthropologist whose research looks at the cultural significance of sweet foods like cake and candy. And where those two different passions kind of run into each other is in objects like this, a carved wooden confectionery mold. I saw one of these for the first time about 20 years ago and ever since then, I have been trying to learn as much as I can about them. And there is a lot to learn. For centuries, carved wooden molds have been used all around the world to make cakes and confectionery. In this slide, you're seeing examples from eight different cultures. Wood is an ideal material for these molds. It's readily available, soft enough to carve easily, but hard enough to hold detail. The porosity of wood can even help molded forms to release more cleanly because it absorbs a small amount of moisture and causes the sweet to shrink slightly. The act of molding changes food in both practical and conceptual ways. Compressing can make a food more durable and portable. A simple mold can imprint food with, an, with important information. Food can be given a shape that either complements or supplements its ingredients. For example, making a cheap ingredient look more luxurious or reinforcing the healthy qualities of a medicinal ingredient. When people eat molded foods, they literally embody the values and wishes expressed by those shapes and patterns. This is why molded confections so often appear as offerings and ceremonial foods allowing participants to fully internalize their beliefs. For my World Wood Day research project, I'm investigating carved wooden confectionery molds in South Korea and Japan, the countries represented in these two images. If you're watching this during the 2023 World Wood Day Symposium, I'm actually in Seoul at the start of my research trip, heading for Japan in April. This presentation is based on preliminary research my more detailed report will be available after I return. In Korea, molds are primarily used in forming two types of food. Duck is a rice cake that comes in many flavors and forms, and dashi is a confection of ground up seeds and spices bound together with honey and starches. In Korea, the use of such molds was believed to originate as early as a thousand years ago, and some ancient molds have been discovered. Over the course of the last 700 years, recipes for the rice cakes and confections originally made for royal feasts spread slowly beyond the palace walls. Duck became ubiquitous, a food eaten by all kinds of people on all kinds of occasions. Made with rarer ingredients, dashi continued to be associated with more rarefied events and with the serving of tea. In Japan, molds are used to produce both higashi, a category of dry sweets made of sugar and starch, and namagashi, moist sweets with bean or yam paste. Eaten fresh, namagashi were often sculpted or molded into of-the-moment seasonal designs. With their longer shelf life, higashi were molded into a wide variety of forms. Location-specific motifs became popular souvenirs as Japanese people began to undertake traveling pilgrimages. In the 19th century, as the price of sugar fell, cheaper higashi were also made in shapes and flavors specifically to appeal to children. The format of each type of mold reflects the specifics of its intended use. Dashi pan feature deep hollows. The fragile, sandy dashi paste is forcibly pressed down into the mold, and the mold forms both the face and the sides of the confection. As with all of these molds, it is essential that the design not contain any undercuts. Those might cause the confection to catch and tear. The dashi pan on the top is a simple one-piece format. The two-part dashi pan on the bottom of this image represents an ingenious innovation. The face design is carved on short cylinders that protrude from the bottom section of the mold. 
Holes that fit over the cylinders are bored through the top section. Spacers keep the top and bottom pieces apart as the mold is filled with the dashi material. Then when the spacers are removed, the top piece can drop down, releasing the dashi from the mold. Because duck has been such a commonplace food, duck sal are notably numerous and diverse. They may take the form of long boards, small rectangles with different types of handles, small round molds, and even three-dimensional sculptures with the mold carved into the base. Many doxal are hung or displayed as household decorations. All doxal are more stamp than mold. They're intended to be pressed down into the soft rice dough, so they imprint a superficial pattern but do not create a three-dimensional form. In this image, a long cylinder of duck is being printed before it is cut into servings. Duck sol are generally oiled and then wetted before use to discourage the dough from sticking. Again, undercuts are to be avoided, but the surface tension of the dough generally keeps it from filling the carving completely. Even a roughly carved duck sol can produce duck with a smooth looking pattern. Like dashipan, kashigata tend to be rectangular. They may have a simple handle and they may be one or two part. The second part of the mold adds depth and volume while making it easier to remove the sweet from the mold. This second part, essentially an outline of the carving with a slight undercut draft, is also easy to replace if it is worn or damaged. Instead of being oiled, kashigata may be moistened to allow the sweets to release more easily. Here, a complex multicolored design is created by carefully packing certain areas with small amounts of a tinted sugar starch mixture, kind of like a three-dimensional coloring book. Once the mold is filled, the material is firmly compressed. The batten is then removed and the confection is carefully tipped out of the mold. It is difficult to draw definitive conclusions about the huge variety of images used in Korean and Japanese molds, but at this stage in my research, a few commonalities and contrasts stand out. In both cultures, molds that convey values or hopes are very common, underlining the idea that molded foods are a way for people to internalize and reinforce these values. In Korea, particularly in Daksal, there is an emphasis on abstract and linear patterns. In Japan, molds tend to be more representational, and their subject matter is voraciously wide-ranging. I have often read that no two Korean molds are alike. Even molds that portray the same subject will be different. In Japan, there are a number of examples of particularly famous or significant molds being copied more or less exactly. This suggests that confectionery molds in Japan had a kind of different cultural commodity than those in Korea. As I said, wood is an ideal material for these molds, but some woods are more ideal than others. Woods that would impart a scent or flavor are avoided, as are those too soft or too likely to split or warp. In Korea, some trees are also avoided for spiritual reasons. Hardwoods like persimmon and box are ideal for capturing sharp details, and sometimes even the end grain of these woods is used for a design that is hard to carve but also extremely hard wearing. For dashipan, boards could easily be would be carefully seasoned and prepared. For duxal, even scraps of wood might be used. In Japan, kashigata are almost always carved from mountain cherry a wood that is stable, durable, and pleasant to carve. Molds are always carved into side grain. Favorite molds will be repaired if they start to split, and on occasion, new molds are carved on the side or backs of old ones. In the past in Korea, there was more of a division. Dashipan carvers were artisans based in more affluent areas of the country. They used a variety of tools and higher quality woods, and they may have also practiced related crafts like carving name seals or printing blocks. Artisans produ produced some doxal, but many more were made by common people. 
because the duxol mold is shallower and the patterns are mostly linear, a usable duxol could be carved with just a knife using almost any available wood. It is said that carving duxol was a winter pastime for many farmers and that most households had a unique duxol that differentiated their rice cakes from those of their neighbors. Today, Master Kim Gusok carves both dashipan and duxol. He appears to be the only full-time professional mold carver in Korea, but he has also taught a number of students. Historically, most Japanese mold carvers appear to have been professionals. I have only seen a few examples of clearly amateur molds carved in remote rural areas. During the last century, some carvers sold their work through wholesale brokers. They appear to have used a wide variety of chisels and gouges, which allowed them to carve particularly complex shapes. As in Korea, mold carving in Japan is in decline. With the deaths of a couple of prominent carvers over the last decade, some expected that the practice of mold carving would come to an end, but luckily a few new carvers have appeared. In some cases, they learned their skills long ago, but did not find enough demand for their goods to actually go into business until recently. Here's a summary of some of the points of similarity and difference between carved molds in Japan and carved molds in Korea. One thing I haven't really discussed so far is the cultural status that these skills enjoy in their different countries. I look forward to learning more about this question and how it affects the practices of current day mold carvers. During my World Wood Day research trip, I have two main goals. First, to learn everything I can about carved molds and mold carving in Japan and Korea, with particular focus on the actions taken by the mold carvers themselves. I will also work to fine tune a methodology for conducting research that is rooted in techniques, but explores their cultural significance. My longer term goal is to expand the geographic breadth of this project. With the participation of the carvers I interview, I would like to create connections between them, as well as make this research into a research resource for carvers in areas where the practice of mold carving has lapsed. I will continue to encourage the use of molds for both sweets making and innovative projects, and to educate the public about the difference between handmade molds and those cast from plastic or cut with a CNC router. I believe that an exhibition would be a good way to accomplish many of these goals simultaneously. Later this year, I will continue my research at the Winter Tour Museum in Delaware, which has a significant collection of early American confectionery molds. These molds were commonly used to imprint cakes for special occasions, including funerals, New Year's Day, and the annual mustering of the militias. Next year, I hope to continue my first-hand technical research in Slovenia and the Czech Republic. Well-known carvers in both of these countries continue to create molds for gingerbread and honey cake. If this topic has been of interest to you, here are some resources that you may wish to seek out. Also, reminder, please keep an eye out for on the World Wood Day website for my research report. And if you've been interested and would like to support this project in some way, uh, there's a variety of different kinds of help that I would be very grateful for. I've split this down into a little bit of a timeline of where, when I expect to be where, so any information, connections, suggestions in these particular places would be great. But at any time, if you have um, information about carvers, molds that are in collections, images of molds that you come across, uh, or personal stories about using these molds or consuming molded sweets, I would absolutely love to hear that information. A lot of the most exciting and important information I have gotten during this research has been sort of uh, tips from people that I've come across. So here is my contact information, website, blog, Instagram, and an email address. And finally, I would just like to thank everybody for being here and thank the World Wood Day Foundation for supporting this project. As I said, I have been doing this work for a very long time 
and it's so exciting to me to finally be able to talk to people about it. So again, thank you, and I look forward to joining you in just a minute to answer some questions. Thank you for this very um, fascinating presentation and such a beautiful figures and carvings, amazing. Thank you. And thank you also for keeping the time. So we have time for a couple of comments and questions. So please. And I see that Sangeta has a hand up, please, Sangeta. Okay, uh, no. really interesting. Wonderful talk and uh, I was very much interested in this word taksal. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we in Hindi, in our language also, this word is there. And it means a place where coins are made. You know, we also have molds. And those oh. molds are used to make coins. So it's a very interesting thing that I heard. And the word taksal is a Hindi word in a way. So, That's fascinating. I have never heard that before. Um, my, <laughs> just, my, just check uh, Google and uh, it's there. Yeah, that's, that sounds great. Um, there is something about the, the word sal um, that means like hand or press. So it's um, yeah. a reference. It's a reference to that, that dynamic action of putting the material into the mold. So that would be fascinating if those things are related. Thank you for that. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you. You know, thank you for saying that this was that the talk was interesting. Also, I really appreciate that. This is, as I said, something that I've been doing for a long time. And, and many times when I tell people this, I get a um, you know some some rolled eyes and some skeptical looks. Um, but I think it's you know it's one of those things. What one of one of the things that always keeps me coming back to sweets, which seems so frivolous and childlike is the fact that they're so universal and that many of our most um, important beliefs and values and things are encoded in sweet foods, right? Um, and so if I go to a country where I wanna to talk to people about their religion, their economic situation, their family histories, I would be so embarrassed to go up to somebody on the street and ask those questions directly. I just, I'm not courageous enough. Um, but if I ask someone, what is your favorite sweet? What is the sweet that you remember from your childhood? They start telling me about all of those other things as part of telling you the story of their sweets. And, you know, even after the decades that I've been doing that, that's still very moving to me and really fascinating to me. And even apart from the whole like craft of the carved wooden confectionery molds, which as a wood carver is just, it blows my mind, mind how technically um, impressive many of these molds are, but they're also, they're like fossils. So they're, they're these hard, durable reminders of ways of life that have very often gone by. And you know, as an, an American, a person who was raised in the American South, it was amazing to me to learn that these were a daily, or maybe not daily, but at least seasonal part of, of life in, in my part of the country for hundreds of years and no one uses them anymore. No one, you don't even see them anymore. That I had to come across these in other countries was very interesting to me. I see you got another mm -hmm. question there. Yes, and it was fascinating to see that this is actually a way of storytelling. So, as you said, they are related yeah. to uh, seasonal celebrations and occasions. But I see that Peter has hand up. Please, Peter. Your just to, just to comment, is... to give a compliment for this wonderful combination of wood culture, food culture. And I just tried to send you a chat note, but I, it doesn't work, I think. But uh, it was really a mouth-watering presentation. If you see these beautiful uh, 3D molds uh, in wood, it's, uh, you would like to eat it. But I, as wood anatomists, we know, of course, that that's not very eatable. But the final product, compliments. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate Indeed. that. So thank you. 